Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday, and I got the date right today. The day right today. Oh, well, it's going to be a little crazy in here. OK, um, as this week comes to a close, I want to take a moment to highlight the incredible progress the president has made for the American people in recent days, from expanding affordable health care to lowering costs and tackling inflation to bringing manufacturing and jobs back to our shores. President Biden started the week at the North American Leaders Summit in Mexico City, where he spoke for, for two hour close cooperation with Mexico and Canada to address shared challenges that impact the American people. Challenges like combating climate change, COVID-19 pandemic, and transnational criminal organizations that are trafficking and smuggling people as well as illicit drugs like fentanyl. The president spoke to our work to take thousands of smugglers off the streets, catch record levels of fentanyl before it even reaches our border, strengthen border security, and increase resources for border communities all over the, all over the opposition of Republican governors and Republican members of Congress, I might add. We've also continued taking action to lower health care costs for American families made possible by President Biden and congressional Democrats enactment of the Inflation Reduction Act. On Wednesday, HHS announced its historic plans for Medicaid for Medicare to directly negotiate negotiate lower prescription drug costs. In addition, starting this month, seniors on Medicare are seeing their insulin costs capped at $35 for a month's supply. They are also now a able to get recommended vaccines for free, all of this thanks to, again, the Inflation Reduction Act. HHS also announced record-breaking enrollment number of health care coverage on the Affordable Health Care Act marketplace. Nearly 16 million people have signed up for this open enrollment period for health care coverage, a 13 percent increase from last year. And it includes over 3 million people who are, who are brand new to the marketplace and were not even done with the open enrollment yet. Because of the cost savings measure in the Inflation Reduction Act that, the, that President Biden signed into law, millions of Americans are continuing to save $800 per year on health insurance on average. And four out of the five healthcare.gov enrollees can, can find coverage for $10 or less a month 
all of this adds up to real, to real impact and meaningful uh, progress to expand affordable, quality health care coverage for American families. And that matters. That matters to the American people. We also had exciting news on the economic front as well. On Wednesday, as you all saw, uh, the largest solar investment in U.S. history, a direct result of the President's economic plan and the Inflation Reduction Act again. This $2.5 billion investment in Georgia will create 2,500 jobs. And yesterday we learned that for the sixth month in a row, inflation has indeed come down. Annual inflation has fallen to lowest level since October of 2021, and gas prices are down by more than $1.70 from their peak, thanks in part to the president's actions to increase oil supply, which were also historic actions that this president took. This is further proof the president's economic plan is working. Even though inflation is high in most major economies, it's coming down in America and giving families more breathing room. You hear the president say that all the time, how he wants to make sure that he's giving American families a little bit more of a breathing room. At the same time, the president is building an economy from the bottom up and middle out, with the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, nearly 11 million jobs created and historic manufacturing investment, like I just mentioned, totaling nearly $300 billion in major investments across the country. And as of as we end this week, on Friday the 13th, as somebody marked, today President Biden welcomed Prime Minister Kishida of Japan to the White House. We will have a joint statement out for all of you shortly, laying out the, their conversation and their discussion uh, this afternoon. But I can tell you that the two leaders are discussing the unprecedented actions we have taken together to better equip us for the 21st century challenges, as well as working to deepen our cooperation on everything from economics to technology, to fighting the climate crisis, advancing peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. Today's visit is a testament to President Biden's investment in our alliances and partnerships since day one, since he walked into the administration. And a historic week is leading into a historic weekend. I am so happy and glad to uh, be joined by my colleague and former mayor of Atlanta, senior advisor for public engagement, Keisha Lance Bottoms, to talk about the, the president's trip this coming Sunday to the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church to remember and honor uh, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. this Sunday, as I just said. Uh, I know many of you had some interest here, so we wanted to make sure that she was here uh, to answer any questions and to lay out why this day is going to be so important. I do want to say on a personal note, as black women, we have broken barriers. This church and the day honoring King are near and dear to both of our hearts. I know on a personal level, we are both looking forward to joining the president on this trip and being uh, in what has been uh, the epicenter of the movement uh, from civil rights in this country for decades. With that, Mayor Bottoms. <laughs> OK, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's kind of scary up here. Right? As Corrine mentioned, I am looking forward to joining the president um, as he travels to Atlanta this weekend. Um, as you, many of you all know, in Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, uh, he expressed many ideals that he would not live to witness. But I stand here, and many of you sit out there as beneficiaries of that dream, his sacrifice and service. So I am eternally grateful for that. Um, as Kareem mentioned, uh, the president is traveling to Atlanta. This is at the invitation of Reverend Warnock, and the president will deliver a sermon at Ebenezer Church, which of course was Dr. King's church. Also, Congressman John Lewis's church. Uh, the president spoke with Senator Warnock last night. Senator Warnock has been the pastor since 2005 at Ebenezer. They had a wonderful conversation about the significance of this historic event, including the fact that the president is the first sitting president uh, to speak at a Sunday service at Ebenezer in its history. Uh, this would have been Dr. King's 94th birthday. As we know, this is an inflection point in history, and the president will deliver remarks reflecting on Dr. King's life and legacy uh, and the way that we can go forward together. 
Following his trip to Atlanta on Sunday, he will join Reverend Al Sharpton on Monday at the National Action Network, which Monday, of course, is the day, the official celebration day of the King holiday. The president will deliver the keynote speech there. And then finally, uh, before I take any questions, this is an important day. As a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, it's our Founders Day, our 110th Founders Day. So the president uh, did a lovely video for the women of Delta. Also, uh, our Secretary of HUD, Marsha Fudge, was also a former national president of Delta. So the president and the vice president are very grateful for all of the support of the women of Delta and the Divine Nine, and happy Founders Day. All right, we'll take a couple questions. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask you if, uh, as you're, as in your role in community outreach, whether the issue of the documents is a particular setback for the president at a moment when other things seem to be going pretty well, inflation's coming down, employment is solid. Like, are you finding that you're getting a lot of response from the public on that? And how do you, how do you play that issue? Um, in my role as senior advisor for public engagement, we've not gotten any information on that in terms of from the public. We've not received any questions. And do you anticipate that that will have any bearing or is, is causing the president to think at all about, it, as he's making his decision about whether to run again, will this um, you know, series of, of, of discoveries have any bearing on his thinking and his thought process as he decides whether to run? I'll refer those questions to the president. He can speak for himself on that. While the president's in Atlanta, what do you expect his message to be on voting rights in particular? And given that the situation in the Senate remains virtually unchanged when he spoke about this issue in Atlanta last year, is he considering any additional executive action on this issue? Well, the president has been very clear that we need Congress to act. He's asked for Congress uh, to codify the John Lewis a Voting Rights Act and also um, the additional Voting Rights Act that's pending uh, before Congress, that's a Freedom to Vote Act. So the President has been very clear that voting, uh, the right to vote, the access to vote is a core a component of our democracy and he's going to continue to push for that. Including on Sunday at the church? Uh, the President will speak on a number of issues at the church, um, including um, how important it is that we have access to our democracy. And you can't come to Atlanta and not acknowledge the role that the Civil Rights Movement and Dr. King played in where we are in the history of our country. But we still have to push forward. We still have more work to do. And just one other thing. Do you expect him to have any engagement with the King family while he's down there? We do expect that. Um, I know in, on previous Sundays, uh, previous King Day services, and Many Sundays prior to the pandemic, Dr. King's sister in particular is often at the service. I don't know if she will be there this Sunday. Um, and we also expect other members of the King family to be there as well. Um, in regards to the, the voting rights, uh, you know, last time, you know, last time at the, around this time when, when President Biden went to Atlanta, some of the civil rights groups and voting rights groups uh, skipped the speech. Um, out of concern that the White House wasn't doing enough uh, to push this issue. Aside from <coughs> wanting Congress to do more, what, uh, what is the message to those um, who feel the White House is not doing enough? Well, as I've been in this role as uh, senior advisor to the president since June of last year, we have engaged with civil rights leaders. He's had them at the White House in a round table. I'm in constant contact with them. And I think that it's very clear that the president is doing everything that he can in his executive power to lean in on voting rights. But we need Congress to do more. This is important. If you've come through the East Wing, you've seen the pictures of Dr. King meeting uh, with Lyndon Johnson, meeting with other civil rights leaders, hashing out voting rights in the White House. And so the fact that we are still here talking about this in 2023, I think really speaks to the fact that we need action. We need that action from Congress. The president has done and will continue to do all that he can do in his executive powers, but there's only so much that he can do. We need Congress to act. 
is, is the feeling then that, that he, is, he has uh, exhausted what he can do, his powers from the White House, his executive powers? Well, if there is more that he can do, we welcome those suggestions. Uh, but as I stand here today, it's my understanding that we have done all that we can do from the executive branch. Now we need Congress to act. Yes, thank you so much, Mayor Williams, for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, when you look at the economy, you saw the unemployment rate come down last month, and yet it went up for black women, for Latinos. What is your reaction? How focused is this administration on trying to make sure that the recovery is equal, is helping African American women? Well, equity is at the center of what we do from this administration. And so that's extremely important. Um, you know, it's been said that when America catches a cold, uh, then black America catches the flu. Well, that's also in relation to the economy. We often know that communities of color and those communities um, that often face additional challenges have additional challenges uh, with the economy. The great news is that the economy is doing much better under this administration. Also, the president is going to continue to lean in to make sure that we have access, access to resources that are specific to communities of color, that are specific to women, uh, to give us those opportunities to be successful in this economy. Do you anticipate him addressing that in his remarks on Monday? I know that he will generally uh, speak about where we are just in terms of helping um, those who are in need in our communities. I don't know if he will specifically address the economy, but as you all know, during uh, Dr. King's last major campaign before his assassination, um, it was called the Poor People's Campaign. Um, and what we know is that from this administration, many of the focus areas have been aligned with, Dr. with what Dr. King was focused on at the time of his assassination. That's making sure that we are creating this beloved community free from hate, free from poverty, giving people access to resources so that they can have what they need to compete and succeed. Thank you. Thinking back to the 2020 campaign, um, part of the president's strategy at the time was going to visit these churches to engage some of the voters that he needed to turn out for him. In South Carolina, there was the 16th Street a bombing anniversary that he spoke at in Alabama, and also on hand in Selma for Bloody Sunday. Is this speech at Ebenezer at the start of a similar outreach campaign heading into 2024? Um, I don't know that it's the start of it, but it could be a great start of it. Um, I know that the president uh, is very interested in connecting with people, hearing directly from people. Uh, it's the best way that any elected official truly hears and understands the needs of people, and there's no better place than to do that than at Ebenezer. Uh, Reverend Warnock has not just been very vocal about the challenges and the issues that are facing people as a candidate, uh, but also as a pastor. And Ebenezer is a cornerstone in the Atlanta community. And I'm sure the president will get an earful on, on what our, our needs and our desires are for our country when he's there. Can you provide any insight into the writing process for this speech? I know that Austin has took a lot of time uh, paying attention to speeches like this. Uh, how long the president's been working on it for? Uh, we've been working on it for a couple of weeks, just as a team, and, and of course with the president's input. And as with any major speech that the president is giving, you, he gives his input, and and the team takes it from there, and then he takes his pen and, and he says what he wants to say, and um, you'll hear that on Sunday. Okay, is it finished? Is it finished? It's finished. No. <laughs> <laughs> Never finished. Uh, um, okay. Hi, just one question. Uh, obviously, Democrats had a big victory in the runoff election uh, in, uh, in Georgia. He's going back to a historic black institution uh, to speak of this church. You know, how do you see the state, uh, your home state, kind of fit into the political landscape going forward now? Georgia is pretty important. Um, I think the whole, I, I've always thought that, now the uh, rest of the country knows it. Um, we know that, that Georgia has paid, played an important role with how our Senate is, is now um, comprised, and I expect that that role will continue to be just as important in future election cycles. And, and remember, Sorry. Uh, I just have to say this, <laughs> go for it, go for it. Uh, Georgia did go for Joe Biden, all right? <laughs>
Go ahead, Ebony. Last question. Um, just a couple of questions. First, whether it be um, on uh, Monday or on Sunday when he's at Ebenezer, is he going to be meeting with any civil rights organizations at any point um, during any of those visits? Well, as I mentioned, on Monday, he will be joining Reverend Al at the National Action Network. There will be many civil rights representatives there. There will be many um, at the church who will also have an opportunity to connect with the president while he's there. Nothing separately? Nothing separately, but there will be some engagement while at the church. And the policy forum with Reverend Al Sharpton, um, when he attends the, the NAN, the NAN um, event, um, what kind of policy can you talk about that you know that they'll be talking about on that on that day? Or what for, what kind of policies do you think that we can kind of expect to hear the president talk about even following that? I know that Rev has been talking about criminal justice reform quite a lot and had several other meetings. Can we see the president pick back up on those same messages following this? Well, the great thing is that this is not a one-time engagement. Reverend Al and some of the other civil rights leaders, I believe from eight other organizations, were in the White House a few months ago, sitting down with the president, sharing their concerns. We, my office, me personally, I'm constantly uh, in, engaged with these civil rights leaders, so we're hearing in real time what our challenges are, and I, I think I can safely say that we have the confidence in many of these leaders that we are doing what we can do and will continue to do more um, as we can to make sure that the needs of our communities are met. Okay. Thank you, Thank you right. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How, how did you feel Thank that you. The, the, the President Biden so Kamala Harris is here of you for, for running mate? Okay, thanks everybody, and thank you so much, Keisha. Appreciate it. Um, I have a couple things at the top that I just want to go through. This is the week ahead, so all of you have this. Um, so, uh, before we take questions. So later today, the president's going to travel to Wilmington, Delaware, as you all know. On Sunday, as you just heard from uh, Mayor Lance Bottoms, the president will travel to Atlanta, Georgia, and deliver a sermon at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And on Monday, he will return to Washington, D.C. to join Reverend Al Sharpton and the National, the National Action Network at their Martin Luther King Jr. Day breakfast where he will deliver the keynote address. On Tuesday, the president looks forward to welcoming Prime Minister Mark Rutte of the Netherlands to the White House to further deepen the historic ties between our two nations. As strong NATO allies and global partners, the two leaders will reaffirm our shared efforts to strengthen transatlantic security and economic prosperity. After that bilateral meeting, the president will welcome the Golden State Warriors to the White House to celebrate their 2022 NBA championship. And next Friday, the president will welcome bipartisan mayors attending the U.S. Conference of Mayors winter meeting to, to the White House. The president will deliver remarks celebrating the achievements of the past 18 months and focusing on the bipartisan work that needs to be done to implement these and other historic pieces of legislative victories at the level at the local level to make difference to make a difference in people's lives across the country. With that, Chris, you want to keep us off? Sure. Uh, question on a couple different topics. Uh, Speaker McCarthy invited the president to deliver the State of the Union on February 7th. Uh, that just went out. Uh, is that the date that the president plans to give the State of the Union? Does he accept that invitation? So we have received Speaker uh, McCarthy's kind invitation, and the president has accepted it, uh, it and looks forward to delivering the State of the Union uh, address on Tuesday, February 17th of 2023. So we are. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry, guys. On Tuesday, February 7th. <laughs> 2023, but we truly uh, appreciate the kind invitation by Speaker McCarthy. Uh, on the uh, debt limit, uh, Republicans want to cut spending as part of a debt limit deal. Is the president willing to cut any spending as part of a debt limit deal, and what would he be willing to cut? Look, as you've heard us uh, say before, uh, we will not be uh, be doing any negotiation over the debt ceiling. And, uh, but broadly speaking, at the start of this new Congress, 
uh, we're reaching out to all the members uh, through the Office of Ledge Affairs, making sure that uh, they, uh, making sure that we have those connections with those new members, as I just stated. But I want to say, like in the past, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, uh, th there's been a bipartisan cooperation when it comes to uh, lifting the debt ceiling, and that's how it should be. That's how it should continue. It's not, it's not, and should not be a political football. This is not political gamemanship, and we are there. This should be done without conditions, and that's how we see this process okay, moving sorry, forward. You say that there'll be no negotiating. You you will not negotiate anything involving spending. With, what with what we're saying is that there should be this should be done without conditions. In the past, we have seen this. Uh, we have seen uh, both Republicans and Democrats come together uh, to deal with this issue. It is a it is one of the basic items that Congress has to deal with, and it should be done without conditions. So there is going to be uh, there is going to be uh, no negotiation over it. This is something that must get done. And uh, does the President agree with the Secretary Treasury Secretary that the debt ceiling should be eliminated? Uh, again, I've spoken to this before. Uh, that is not, uh, no one is, t is talking about eliminating the debt ceiling or the debt limit. That's not what we're talking right about right now. Uh, Congress is, is going to need to raise the debt limit without condition. So that is not what the discussion that we're having. Very last thing, have White House officials been interviewed by the special counsel or by the Justice Department uh, involving the classified documents? So what I'll say from here is uh, any any questions that you we may have about the review about the process, I would refer you to the Department of Justice. Uh, I would also refer you to my colleagues over at the White House Council. Uh, I'm not going to get into any specifics from here. Go ahead, Mary. Aside from the special counsel, aside from this review, I just have a question about process and classified documents and their handling, because I think there's some confusion amongst the public and, and even in this room. You know, what is the process to make sure that classified documents aren't accidentally or intentionally taken when a president or vice president leaves office? You know, what's the protocol or is this sort of just you know, a, a self review system? It, it's a good question. I would, on the process and how that works, I would just, I would certainly re, re, uh, refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. They would know that. They can walk you through that, my colleagues there. Uh, and and I know many of you have been uh, have been in touch with my colleagues in the last 24 hours, in direct touch, and answering many of your questions. So I would refer you to them on the specific process so that they will, they will certainly uh, guide you in the right way. And it, but as far as you know, is it ever okay for classified documents to be mixed with personal What evidence? I can say, uh, look, what I can say is what the president has said before, what I have said multiple times, we take this very seriously. The president takes uh, classified information, classified documents very seriously. Uh, but look, you know, I've said, this, uh, I've said this before, we have addressed this issue multiple times at length. Uh, and uh, we have been fully cooperating uh, with uh, the Dep Department of Justice, and now we will be doing the same with the special counsel's office out of just to be prudent here and just to make sure that uh, we are consistent. Uh, I would refer you anything that is related to this uh, to the, as it relates to the review to the Department of Justice or my colleagues at the White House Counsel uh, Office, and this is the, we see it as the best way to move forward. We want to respect the process, uh, and so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to refer you to the Department of Justice. Clear, you're confident he followed whatever protocol was in place. Again, this is something that he takes very seriously. Uh, the president, when it comes to classified documents, when it comes to classified information, I'm not going to go into any specifics from here. If you have any questions, anything further that's related to the review, or uh, I will refer you to the Department of Justice, or my colleagues over at the White House Counsel's Office, who I know many of you who I'm staring at right now has been in close touch. Go ahead, Ed. A few things, Karine, thank you. For, uh, following up on the State of the Union, um, I believe it was the president who suggested he has spoken with Speaker McCarthy. Are there any plans for them to meet in person before February? Yeah, they spoke, and I think we actually share that with all of you. The day that um, uh, Speaker McCarthy became Speaker, uh, you uh, you heard, uh, you saw a statement from the President and the First Lady uh, congratulating uh, congratulating uh, Kevin McCarthy becoming Speaker. And then the next day, I believe it was, that was on a Friday, I believe the next day, which was a Saturday, uh, the President had a direct conversation. He connected uh, with uh, Speaker McCarthy and congratulated him in in, in person, no for, um, I don't have I don't have a plan. I don't have a uh, a scheduled meeting to share with you at this well, time. I wanted to follow up on a few things from yesterday. Uh, when was the president informed about the attorney general's decision to appoint a special counsel? How and by whom? So, I the specifics on that I can tell. Here's what I can tell you. I can tell you that we were not giving a heads up 
I was asked that question yesterday. We did not know that, that was the announcement was going to come yesterday until after it happened, so I can clear the deck there and let you know. Anything else specific to uh, when the President knew or anything that's related to this, I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. I know many of you that I'm looking at right now has been in close touch with my colleague there, uh, and, uh, and so I would uh, continue to refer you to, uh, to my colleague at the White House Counsel's Office. One of the things that they finally uh, confirmed for us is that Bob Bauer is indeed the President's personal attorney handling some of this. Uh, given that the Justice Department cited the personal counsel as having made this uh, initial outreach to National Archives and has been in touch with the Justice Department, is that the person who these questions should be directed to? Why the White House counsel? I will say this again. I would, whatever the White House counsel, my colleague told you uh, in your conversation, I know you guys just spoke or connected earlier today, uh, I would uh, ask them that question. And anything related to the review, I would refer you to the Department of Justice. And um, regarding the uh, extraordinary measures that the Treasury Secretary announced uh, a little while ago in advance notice to Congress, is there a policy that requires her to give advance notice of those plans? You would have to you have to reach out to the Department of Treasury on how that process works. What I can say is uh, just so that everyone knows, the folks who are watching, uh, the debt limit is projected to be reached on Thursday, January 19th. At that point, Treasury will begin to take extraordinary measures to prevent uh, default. Secretary Yellen did not name a specific X date, if you will. Uh, the day Treasury would know, uh, the day Treasury would no, no longer be able to pay the government's obligations, but quoting from the Secretary's letter, it's unlikely that that cash and extraordinary measure, measures will be exhausted before early June. But does, that does not mean that Congress should not wait until then to raise the debt ceiling, as we have been saying over and over again. The sooner Congress acts, the better, since even the prospect of not raising the debt ceiling will have de damage uh, the full faith and the credit of our nation. Uh, and again, we are going to continue to, uh, to encourage con Congress to act. But as far as the steps and, and how this all works, I would refer to the Department of Treasury. Six days till the 19th. A few years ago, she did it about 10 days before. I, I understand. I would refer you to the Department of Treasury. There's nothing to it being announced today amid the situation I, that the White I, House is facing. I would refer you to the Department of, of Treasury. And just to be very clear here, uh, Ed, we have. I've been in here almost every day since we got back from Mexico City, standing here taking your questions at length. Uh, so that we're not avoiding anything here, and no, you've yeah, heard, yeah, you've yeah. heard, you've heard from the president at least twice, and you, we have put forth multiple uh, statements from the White House Counsel's Office. So that suggestion, I just disagree with. Go ahead, Kristen. Green, thank you so much. Does the White House and does the president? Um, agree to fully cooperate with the special counsel investigation. We have said that we are going to continue to continue to fully co cooperate. We have been uh, th uh, the president's lawyers and team has been fully cooperating uh, with the Department of Justice, and we're certainly they're certainly going to do that with uh, the, the special counsel. And so, by that reasoning, would the president agree to sit for an on the record in person? I'm just not. Or... I'm not going to get into specifics or get ahead of what's going to happen. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals because that is a hypothetical. What I will say is uh, we have addressed this multiple times uh, at length, and we are going to continue, uh, the President's team is going to continue to fully cooperate with the Department of Justice, uh, and we respect that process, and that's what we're going to do. The President has said he hopes to speak about this soon. When can people expect to hear from him about uh, this? Don't have, again, that's a, that is, that is something that I can't, I don't have a, a magic wand here. I don't know when that's going to happen. What I can say is uh, his team is going to fully cooperate with the Department of Justice. Uh, and let's not forget, the President said during the campaign that when it comes to the Department of Justice independence, he respects that. Uh, and that is something that he had said was incredibly important to make sure that they had their independence. That's why we say we're going to make sure that uh, they have their independence, and that's why I'm saying that we're, we're going to refer to Department of Justice. And, and let me just ask you a big picture question here. Does the White House, broadly speaking, have an obligation to share not just with the National Archives, but with the American people? when the existence of classified information is found in a private location. Again, there is a process in this. But just big picture, not necessarily we, in this instance, well, but is, is it the policy of the White House that, that they should share that information not just with the National Archives, but with the American people? So I, I'll say this, Kristen. We have been 
transparent in the last couple of days. In, remember, there's an ongoing process, and we have spoken when it is appropriate. Uh, and we have shared, again, I've been here almost every day, not every day, but from Wednesday, yesterday and today, taking your questions on this. The White House Council has uh, put out uh, a very extensive multiple uh, statements on this as well. And you all, I know, you all have been talking, many of you here have been talking to my colleague in the White House Council. So what the, the, um, the actions that we took were right, right actions that his team took uh, in, de in, in uh, dealing with the Department of Justice and also the archives. But Look, you, I have, I you have. You guys have answered questions when the press has broken and the news. Because it's an ongoing process. Because again, it is an ongoing process. There is a process here. The Department of Justice is independent. We respect that process. But again, I have taken questions. I can take two, two questions through 100 questions. I have answered your questions uh, as uh, almost every day on this issue. And again, anything else that you may have, anything that's related to the review, I would refer you to one, the Department of Justice. One last question, because I know you've got to move on here. But the, the president campaigned on the argument that he would restore confidence. We know that he's in the process of deciding whether to officially announce he's running for re-election. Does this episode undercut that argument that, that he would restore confidence? Because here we have in the headlines that he is now under investigation. He's restored independence in the Department of Justice. That's what we're doing here. When we're saying we're going to refer you to the Department of Justice, that is restoring independence as it, as it relates to issues like this. And that is important to the president. And it's been consistent. What I am saying about investigations has been consistent for the last two years. You've heard me over and over again when it comes to a legal issue or a matter like this. Uh, we have always referred to the Department of Justice. So there's nothing here, uh, different here. Uh, we have said we wanted to restore the independence of the Department of Justice. Uh, that is what you're seeing. Uh, and again, we this has been done in a transparent way uh, when it relates to how this was uh, dealt with with the Department of Justice uh, and the archives. The President takes this very, very seriously. Any other questions that you may have about this particular issue, uh, about the review, I would refer you to the Department of Justice. You guys have been in touch with my colleagues at the White House Counsel Office, and I would uh, suggest that you continue to reach out. Go ahead, Stephen. Thanks. I just want to press you on that point about the idea of disclosures when it's appropriate. <coughs> you describe a process, but it sort of feels like a strategy, a communication strategy to protect the president from political damage. Was it the hope and expectation here that this would have remained a private matter and not have been subject to public disclosure? Look, Stephen, that's your version of the case. I've been very clear here, uh, and uh, I've answered that question multiple times in different versions, right, uh, in the last couple of days. Look, I want to be very clear. There is a process here. We are going to respect the process. This is all part of the Department, uh, just, uh, Department of Justice uh, process, uh, and we are cooperating fully. We are cooperating fully in this process. And uh, again, uh, the President believes that the Justice Department uh, and its independence needs, needed to be restored. That's what you have seen under this administration the last two, year, two years. And I want to be consistent in what I'm saying. I want to be prudent in what I'm saying when I say that we are going to defer any questions related to this to the Department of Justice and any other items that you have. If you don't want to talk to the Department of Justice, you're free to, to talk to the White House Counsel Office. I know you guys have been in touch with my colleagues there. We have done both. But let, let me just ask you, because oftentimes in the careers of White House press secretaries, it becomes, there comes a time where they are asked you know, what they knew and when they knew it. Were, were you or any member of your staff involved in the crafting of a strategy as to when this disclosure should be made? in advance of CBS News breaking the story on Monday evening? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Did you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> that means a bit of it. Um, a couple of equal questions for you. Do you have a, a, a position on how high the debt limit should be raised? I don't have a, a position on that. What I can say more broadly, what, wait, well, I, I mean, what, what I'm saying is that, more broadly speaking, not going to get into the specifics of that, uh, what I can say is that we believe when it comes to the debt limit, it has been done in a bipartisan way uh, over the years. 
uh, and uh, decades, and it should be done in a bipartisan way, and it should be done without conditions. That is important here. Uh, and so we're going to continue to uh, uh, encourage uh, and ask Congress to take action, uh, and that's where we're going to leave it at this time. We're not going to do any negotiations, or uh, and it should be, again, again, done without conditions. Calls to Congress and all? Is this a ledge affairs well, I, thing, I, or is it entirely I, to Congress? I mean, I've said that the ledge, our Office of Ledge Affairs has been in, in touch with the new Congress uh, to make <laughs> sure that they know who to reach out, the appropriate people to reach out on the uh, Office of Ledge Affairs. Uh, and so we're going to continue. We're always having conversations with member, members of Congress. Uh, the President ha always has multiple conversations with members of Congress. As you know, he has a lot of uh, longtime friends who are over, uh, over on the other side of, of, of Pennsylvania. And so uh, that is something that continues. But when it comes to this, when it comes to the debt limit, it should be done without conditions. It was done under the last president three times uh, in a bipartisan way. And so this should be, this should continue. Very quickly on the CPI data yesterday, you know, pretty good result <coughs> there. That comes on the heels of the jobs data, which was pretty strong. Uh, your officials have been kind of you know, jazzed about that, it seems, on TV in the last 24 hours or so. Uh, is it fair to say that the White House is thinking this is what a soft landing could look like, or are you not getting that far? Uh, look, what what we can say. Team soft, <laughs> team soft landing. I'll say this, and as you said, you've heard from many of my colleagues who are in, in the, who are economists who have been working on this issue, pushing forward the President's economic plan. Look, uh, it just goes back to uh, the President's economic uh, plan, and we see it as it's working, right? With what the, the vision that the President has for this country, when you think about when he came in, he passed the American Rescue Plan, you think about all the other historic pieces of legislation, the bipartisan uh, infrastructure legislation. I, t I talked, I talked multiple times in, in the, at the top about the Inflation Reduction Act. Look, it is, it, it matters what the vision of a President is and him acting out on it, and that's what you saw. When you see inflation down for six months, uh, that that matters, right? That's because of the President's economic plan. When you see annual inflation down 6.5 percent from where it was over, uh, this summer, just this summer at 9.1 percent, uh, gas prices down by by uh, about more than a buck 70 uh, uh, per, from, from its peak. All of that matters. And so that's how we're seeing this. We're seeing it as the President's economic plan is indeed working. We are going to continue to put the American families and American people first and work on this issue that you hear us talk about all the time. His number one economic issue, issue is bringing down inflation. That's why the Inflation Reduction Act, what I talked about, when you think about health care, when you think about Medicare and negotiating those prices, uh, when you think about what we announced in Georgia, 2,500 jobs are going to be created because of the Inflation Reduction Act, all of that, all of that matters, and all of that is important in its more broadly speaking about the uh, the present economic plan. Look, we believe that we continue to be in this a transition of stable and steady growth, and I think that's what we believe that's what the numbers uh, continue to show as you talk about the jobs report that we saw recently, and as you talk as we talk about the CPI data. Uh, I'm just I'm just saying that we are in this transition of a stable <laughs> transition to stable and steady growth, and we. We believe that the economic, the president's economic policies that he's put forward in the past two years, we see that working. Good. Uh, thanks. U.S. Attorney John Losh was looking into this for for several weeks uh, before he was in touch with looking into uh, what exactly the classified documents. Okay. He was in touch uh, with uh, President Biden's counsel. I, w I wanted to know, was the was President Biden was the White House surprised that along with uh, with Merrick Garland that they decided that more investigation was needed and a special counsel was uh, was called was appointed. What I can tell you is that we were not given a heads up uh, that the that Attorney General Garland was uh, going to make his made his announcement yesterday on the special counsel. Uh, that is something that we learned, uh, like many of you. Uh, uh, watching the news, uh, I'm not going to get into uh, into anything further from that. Uh, I can't speak to this person who you just mentioned, who has been, I don't know, having conversations or making comments about this. I'm just not going to get into that. I'm not going to uh, re give reactions from here. What I can tell you is, that, again, I'm going to refer you to the White House Counsel uh, and um, Office to talk to my colleagues on any particular questions that you may have that's related uh, to this process, and if it's 
uh, something that you want to know specifically about the review, I would refer you to Department of Justice. When, when President Biden did say, you know, God willing, uh, he hoped to be able to say more soon. I mean, it seemed like he was thinking that the investigation would end soon. Was he surprised? I, again, I'm just not going to uh, go beyond what the president said. Uh, I will say this is that uh, we are we are um, we are going to continue to fully cooperate. Uh, as I've said, we have talked about this at length. Uh, we've had multiple statements on this. And again, we want to be prudent here. I'm going to be consistent here. Uh, any questions that you may have about this process, I would refer you to the uh, White House Counsel. Another, another topic. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, administration's appeal of the Sutherland Springs uh, mass shooting case. Does it concern uh, the administration that some gun control advocates are concerned or worried about the appeal by uh, the DOJ and that that appeal undercuts Biden's own stance on background checks? And actually also that the NRA is essentially applauding the DOJ's move. So look, when it comes to uh, issues like this, legal issues, that is something that the Department of Justice uh, deals with. Again, they are independent. Uh, so. I would refer you to them on their decision. Uh, the president continues to be committed uh, on uh, making sure that we address an issue that is affecting families across the country, communities across the country, which is gun violence. That's why it was so critical when he signed the bipartisan uh, piece of legislation on gun violence just a couple of months ago this past summer. And uh, he's going to continue uh, to call for the ban of assault weapons, working with Congress to make that happen. Uh, and let's not forget, the first year and a half of this administration, we Put forward, we put forward more executive actions than any other president on dealing with this issue, on dealing with protecting uh, our communities, protecting families, dealing with gun violence. And that, that, is, uh, uh, that call that he has, especially the call to action from Congress, is going to continue and it's not going to stop. I'm going to go to the back. Okay. Um, I have two questions on the meeting with the Prime Minister, but just briefly on the documents. We have seen online propaganda from adversaries seeking to take advantage from this revolution. Uh, revolution. I'm sorry, can you say, can you go back a little bit? Who's, see, who's seeking to take advantage? We have seen online propaganda from adversaries seeking to take advantage of the revelation of the classified documents. I wonder if you can share with us whether the uh, administration is anticipating any kind of national security implications from this fallout. Are you hearing any kind of intelligence, and are you doing anything to deter those threats? Again, I'm just not going to talk about uh, any intelligence from here. Uh, I would certainly, uh, anything that's related to this, I would refer you to Department of Justice and, to, uh, and also refer you to my colleagues at the White House Council. I'm just not going to go into anything, any, for, especially national security ish, uh, uh, affairs, and so I would refer you to them. I, I'd probably follow up with your national security That'd be great. council affairs. Okay, uh, That'd be on, great. on the meeting, um, I know we're waiting for a readout, but if you can tell us whether the leaders spoke about semiconductors and whether Japan confirmed that it will enact export controls to limit Chinese access to semiconductors, and whether the Prime Minister again urged President Biden, as he has done so many times, if he would be open to joining CPTPP. So on CPTPP, uh, this is not an option we're exploring. I think we've said that before. Uh, we're focused on the I IPEF, as you know, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, negotiations and deepening our economic ties with those 13 partners, uh, many of which are TPP uh, partners. So that is going to be our focus. Uh, that has not changed. Uh, as it relates, again, I wanna, don't want to get ahead of the conversation. They're currently uh, still uh, having a dialogue. There's, the bilateral is still occurring. Uh, but I expect they will discuss China, Russia, Russia's war against Ukraine, and the DPRK's unlawful nuclear and missile programs. Uh, and the leaders will focus on what they can get done together in 2023. Japan holds uh, in the G7 presidency and has just taken a non-permanent seat uh, on the UN S Security Council. While we're hosting the APEC and seeking to make shift progress on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, Prime Minister Kishida arrived at the White House, as you all know. I believe my colleague laid out uh, what came out of that 2 plus 2 uh, after consulting closely with us and regional partners in, in Europe. And I expect the President and the Prime Minister Kishida will, will debrief on those consultations. Again, don't want to get ahead of, we're going to have a readout for you. They're having this conversation currently. Uh, and so once we have the readout this afternoon, we certainly will share that. If I can just dig a little bit deeper on IPEF, Krim, because we really haven't heard much about this framework since it was launched 
last year. So at this point, it seems like the administration still believes that this is the best offer that the U.S. can give to counter Chinese uh, trade clout. Is that, am I understanding this so correctly? let me just, so as you said, it was announced in Tokyo just this past May, um, and, uh, and Japan was a critical partner, as you know, uh, in helping us to build support, particularly among Southeast Asian countries. So that is important. Again, Japan has been a critical partner in this. Uh, IPEF partners represent 40 percent of the world GDP, uh, and we are united in our belief that much of our success in coming, in coming decades will depend on how well governments harness innovation. So that is part of it, right? We got to see how uh, this works through, especially the transformations afoot in the clean energy, digital technology sectors, while fortifying our economies against a range of threats from fragile supply chains to co uh, corruption to tax havens. So again, with Japan's partnerships and leadership in the negotiations, we expect to achieve high standard uh, commitments that will deepen our economic engagement in the region and make good progress in text-based negotiations this year. So this is a partnership that is incredibly important. Japan played a very big role in it. When you think about uh, it represents the 40 percent of the world GDP. Uh, and so, look, this is, again, an important partnership. This is a framework that we are incredibly committed to, and we appreciate uh, Japan's partnership in this. Mm -hmm. I'm Warren. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, thanks, Creighton. I, I want to ask you about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so the U.S. Chamber of Commerce embraced President Biden in 2020, and now the president of the U.S. Chamber says that the businesses it represents are fed up with the government making it harder to do business and adding new rules and regulations. Do you have any response? Yes, I do. Um, first thing, the president's uh, first two years in office have been the, the best for job creation in history when you think about 10.5, nearly 10.5 million jobs created. Uh, Manufacturing and small businesses are on the rise, and we are seeing progress in our fight against global inflation. So, so that's the first piece to uh, to just lay out there. The second, uh, look, I don't think that it's all uh, all of the chamber's presidents who said that. She also called out polarization and gridlock and called for permitting reform, immigration reform, improving child care, improving climate resilience, and funding law enforcement. So those are all areas where President uh, has called for Congress to act. And we also agree with the chamber that Congress must address and th the debt limit, and we can, quote, not play chicken with the true faith and credit of the United States. That's end quote. And, and lastly, let me just say, as I think everyone is aware, the last two years showed historic bipartisan progress for the American people. I've talked about in this and during this uh, press uh, during this press briefing those pieces of legislation, again, historic pieces of legislation, including on rebuilding our infrastructure and investing in American manufacturing. Uh, so the president's plans on infrastructure, next generation research, clean energy and manufacturing are strongly supported by business community. Uh, again, you know, we do outreach to different communities when we talk about these important pieces of legislation, when we talk about the president's economic plan, but he also believes big corporations should pay, should pay their fair share in taxes. And that's not just us. That's also the American public who believes that they should be doing this. Well, she said also that there's government uh, regulatory overreach, adding, and I'll quote her, when regulations are driven by ideological agendas and imposing, imposed on businesses without transparency, accountability, or clarity, government isn't working. So will there be changes in its government so, work? So I'll say this. Our administration is leveraging every available tool to advance the president's ambitious agenda for the country and to deliver for the American people. That's the president's primary goal. When he comes, when he came into the administration, and it continues to be the case, he wanted to make sure that he's de delivering for the American people, delivering for American families, making sure that we're building an economy from the bottom up, middle out, and that's what you are seeing. I was just asked about the inflation data, the CPI data, and the jobs report. We are seeing, while there's still more work to do, we are seeing the economic, the president's economic policy is actually working. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Alex, in the back. Uh, yeah, Queen. earlier this uh, week we discussed the situation in Florida with, I think, about uh, 350 Cuban migrants landing at uh, Dry Tortuga and Key West. Um, I believe you, you, you said uh, it was a political ploy on the part of uh, Governor DeSantis to deploy the National Guard. His office has said that the Coast Guard requested help uh, patrolling the waters off Florida. So can you just kind of discuss your understanding of the situation yep. uh, in Florida and how that how that understanding has developed 
yep. in the last several And I'm going to be, and I'm happy to repeat what I said, which is Governor DeSantis has made a mockery of uh, of the system, and uh, and he has cons consistently and constantly, as many of you have reported, uh, has done political stunts. Has not helped to uh, address the issue, but has instead decided to uh, put the lives of migrants who are coming here uh, for a better life at risk. And that's what we have seen from this governor. Look, when it comes to the Coast Guard and Customs and Border Protection, they are deploying additional personnel and resources to Florida to quickly process individuals and place them in removal proceedings. I would note that the migrants from Cuba were, who arrived in Florida over a week ago were processed and moved out of the state by Border Patrol within days. Uh, the, at the national park that you mentioned, it reopened just this past Sunday. Uh, the president has expanded safe, orderly, legal pathways for migration, including for Cubans. And we continue to urge individuals to, to use those uh, instead of risking their lives at the hands of human, uh, human strugglers. And you heard that directly from this president uh, just a couple of days ago on the world stage in Mexico City. Uh, I'm going to try and call folks I haven't. Go ahead, Karen. Folks I haven't called. Um, you, I called, I called over you early. Go ahead, Karen. Um, you've several times today referred people to the White House counsel for questions about the process and the review. Would you bring Richard Sauber here or someone from his team to answer these questions in the briefing room in a formal capacity? So, look, the White House counsel's office uh, has provided information uh, on this uh, for this week as appropriate. Uh, again, I, I think I just said this, I've said this multiple times during this briefing, uh, that I know in the last 24 hours, my colleagues at the White House Counsel has been, uh, White House Counsel's Office has been in touch with many of you and has answered a lot of your questions. Uh, and so uh, that will continue. You reach out to them and they will, uh, they will certainly in engage. Uh, and so I'm going to leave it there. But again, I w anything that is related to this review, I would, I would send you to Department of Justice. Again, if, if there is something specific uh, to, uh, to this uh, that uh, you want from us, I would refer you to the White House Counsel uh, Office. And, and is the White House concerned that this investigation is going to overshadow what you are trying to do right now, what your message is right now? Look, our message is very clear, and it will continue to, to, uh, to be uh, just that. And you've seen it. That's why when I started the briefing, I laid out uh, all of the uh, um, all of the kind of progress that we have made just this week alone. When you think about the Inflation Reduction Act, when you think about how it's going to lower cost uh, for American families, uh, when you think about uh, the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, just recently, as you all, some of you were there in Kentucky, where you saw bipartisanship uh, talking about a bridge that has, for decades, for decades, presidents have talked about uh, fixing that bridge. And this president, because of the bipartisanship that he was able to bring together, got that done. And so, look, we're not going to stop talking about how we're going to deliver for the American people. I actually think, and we actually believe, there are, uh, there are people who are watching, the American people who are watching want to hear that. They want to hear what I just laid out at the beginning of the briefing. They want to know how this president, how this administration, how the federal government is delivering for them. So we're, again, we're going to continue to have those conversations. You're going to continue to hear from me speaking about that. You heard from the president yesterday talking about uh, the CPI data and how in, important it was uh, to see inflation go down uh, in six, six months and how we're seeing record low unemployment in 50 years. That is conversation and that work is going to continue. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.